Chapter 10 It's been two days, and we haven't seen anything, complained Bree as she peered through a set of binoculars while she lounged in a comfortable chair. They had been taking turns sleeping, eating, watching television, and looking at the windows of Miss Everly's apartment. Even with the high-powered telescope lenses and a heat-sensing device, all they had seen was Miss Everly and her paid help. If David Ramsley was hiding in that apartment, he was keeping to the bedroom or bathroom. Something that Bree seriously doubted. It didn't make sense. Could someone have tipped him off that we were watching? Everett wondered. He struck another name off their list of possible people to question. They had been both calling various persons of interest in the case, asking probing questions as to David's activities. Mostly, they were hitting brick walls. No one wanted to talk about David, or they wanted to vent, giving an earful of anger but no useful information. I don't see how, frowned Bree. I don't think he's there. Then Uncle Oscar lied to us, scowled Everett. He should have known better than to trust the man, but he had always liked his uncle. Now what? I need to think. Bree set aside the binoculars. We know that David is communicating with multiple people, including a film director, ghostwriter, his lawyer Kramer, and Crawford. The film director and ghostwriter said it's through a third party that they won't name. Unless I give up five million. Everett blew out a frustrated breath. We might have to do it. That's a lot of money with no guarantee that the ghostwriter is going to tell us the truth, she cautioned. What about returning to the island to see if we can find any more clues? asked Everett. If I were Crawford, I would have moved them. Bree moved from her chair to sit with Everett, leaning against him. There has to be something that we are missing. Everett wrapped an arm around her, pulling her closer. Then we'll think harder and figure it out. Bree nodded, relaxing. Would you like to come to a wedding with me? Everett asked suddenly. Actually, a couple of weddings. Really? Bree shifted so she could see his face. Who's getting married? I've been invited to Drew and Bethany's wedding, Everett told her. Plus, my brother is going to propose today to Sterling. If she accepts, and it sounds like she will, they will probably be getting married soon. That could be fun, smiled Bree. Okay. Good. Everett had an answering smile before a phone trilled, interrupting the moment. Bree dug in a pocket, pulling out her cell. Hey, Marty, what's up? Put him on speaker, requested Everett. She nodded and touched the screen. I found the most interesting thing when I did. Marty's voice came over the cell. At first I thought Crawford was on a conference call between David and the ghostwriting guy, whose name is Phil, by the way. Then I checked the phone records, and I realized it was a two-way call. There was no third party, which could only mean one thing. When Everett and Bree had handed back the stolen USB drive to Crawford, Marty had put a hidden program that would give him access through the internet to computer files. By making Crawford paranoid about what was on the file, he had checked out the program on his computer, downloading their piggybacked virus that gave Marty free reign through any connected networks. They had discovered, much to Marty's delight, that Crawford had Alexa downloaded into his smart house system. Marty had access to the phone records, the computer, the tablet, even the grocery list that the fridge was tallying up for the grocery delivery service. David is with Phil, breathed Bree. When was the call? This morning, two hours ago. However, that isn't where David is, cautioned Marty. What do you mean? asked Everett with a frown. When I rendered the audio through a couple of programs, I noticed that the background sound when David speaks is the same as when Crawford speaks he said triumphantly. David is at Crawford's, concluded Everett. Grab the cameras. Bree jumped to her feet. We are going to get a couple of pictures, send them directly to Kepler, and bam, we've got our man. Forget the cameras, Marty shouted into the phone. He has an in-home security system. There are cameras all over the house that he arms when he goes away. I took the liberty of turning some on and recording the footage. What? Everett paused in the act of grabbing the car keys from the coffee table. When did you figure that out? Today? Marty's voice danced with excitement. I have grainy video of Mr. Fugitive David Ramsley with Crawford, 
time-stamped and all. Check out your phones. Everett and Bree huddled over her phone, looking at the picture messages that Marty had sent them. There he is. We have to get this to Kepler, Bree told Everett. Call him and set up a meeting. I want to discuss a plea deal for my dad in person. Everett was grim. Then we can hand over all the information. Thank you, Marty. That's what I'm here for, Marty replied happily. I'll keep an eye on David and make sure he isn't going anywhere. You are getting a bonus, promised Everett before Bree ended the call. She dialed Kepler's number. Bill Kepler, came his strong and slightly annoyed voice. Bill, we need to talk. Bree grinned in excitement. We know where David Ramsley is. Where? Kepler immediately became more interested. We hand over the location and the photo proof. In return, you give us, in writing, a plea deal for my father. Everett jumped in. Done. I want to get this set up as soon as possible to nail him before he moves again, responded Kepler. Email me the plea deal and we can make it happen. Everett smiled in satisfaction. Give me time to get my supervisor involved, Kepler told them. I'll get back to you. Hurry up, advised Bree. We're not certain how much longer David's going to remain at the location. If he moves, you need to track him, warned Kepler. I will be in touch. The call ended. Bree and Everett grinned to each other. Finally! Everett scooped Bree into his arms and twirled her around. You and Marty are amazing. Admit it. You didn't think we could do it, laughed Bree. I totally admit it. However, you surprised me in all good ways, he assured her. Setting her back on her feet, he gave her a quick kiss. We should go to Crawford's home just in case David does decide to leave. Then we'll at least have a chance at following him. Agreed, Bree said breathlessly. Grab the cameras and let's go. They quickly packed up what they needed and went down to the car. Slow down a little, cautioned Everett as Bree took a corner a little fast. We don't need to lose David just because we're getting a ticket. Bree grimaced, but pulled her foot a little off the gas. We also don't need to lose him because we missed getting there in time. Everett grabbed his cell phone, dialing Marty's number. I have an idea. Tell me, said Marty as he tapped away on a computer. David is getting ready to move. He has his coat on and an overnight bag. Crawford is grabbing his keys. I'm working on trying to get the house alarm to go off, but I'm not sure it will work. Crawford has some nice-looking vehicles. Does he have OnStar? asked Everett. Could you track him through that? If I had two hours to hack in, Marty sounded a little frazzled. Plus, I'd need some VIN numbers and all sorts of information that we don't have. We're running out of time. Tell me you are close. Not close enough. Everett glanced at Bree as she laid on the gas, pulling around a car. He checked that his seatbelt was secure. You need to call Kepler, Bree told Everett. They can track David through the traffic cameras. We can't. I have yet to receive the email for the plea deal yet. He grabbed the dash as Bree slammed on the brakes for a city bus. We lose David. There is no deal, reasoned Bree. She honked the horn. Use my phone so Marty can stay on yours. They've left the house and are getting into the car, Marty informed them. I'm going to try to set off the house alarm now. I will call Kepler, Everett said grimly, searching through Bree's contacts, selecting Bill Kepler. Kepler here, he greeted them. We're sending the deal now. A reduced sentence recommended for humanitarian reasons due to medical conditions and the accessory to drug smuggling charges dropped. Depending on the judge, Robert will spend seven to ten years in a minimum security facility, all in return for the location of David Ramsley. Perfect. Everett breathed a huge sigh of relief. David is at Crawford's, but he's leaving the house right now. We're trying to stall him, but I'm not sure that we can. Everett confirmed the address with Kepler, sending the grainy time-stamp pictures Marty has taken as proof. We're on our way, Kepler told them before ending the call. Bree laid on the gas again. We do want to get there alive, mentioned Everett. We will. Bree concentrated on driving. Marty, what's happening? They're calling the alarm company, said Marty with satisfaction. They think the alarm's malfunctioning. David isn't pleased. He has places to be. Can you find out where he might be going? wondered Everett. I put on Alexa and I'm listening to the audio, but so far they haven't mentioned a location, 
Marty sighed in annoyance. How far away are you? Ten minutes, announced Bree. Twenty, estimated Everett. Slow down a little. Stop worrying. Bree swerved to avoid a cyclist. Everett clenched his teeth and wished he were the one driving. David wants to leave, Marty told them. I'm about to have a fridge malfunction. Can you do that? Everett wanted to know. Oh yeah, ice cube bonanza, Marty yelled in triumph. Spit those cubes out. I want the video of this when it's over, commented Everett. David is royally unhappy. He's motioning to his watch, Marty told them the commentary. Crawford is unplugging the fridge. Not a good move with all that seafood in there. Can you make the alarm go off again? asked Bree. Nope, the alarm company has disabled it. It'd take longer than a couple minutes to get into their system now. Marty was mournful. I think that's all I have in my arsenal. The only thing I can do is tell you which way they come out of the drive. The rest is up to you. Bree made a wicked turn onto Crawford's road. They're in the car, said Marty, backing up. Bree slammed on the brakes, blocking the driveway. We're here at the house. Everett got out of the vehicle, walking up to the passenger door. He grabbed the handle, but it was locked. Everett banged on the window with a fist as he peered inside. Cursing, he straightened. It's not him. What? Bree was incredulous. Marty saw him on the video. It's not him. Everett ran a hand through his hair. It looks like him, but that isn't my uncle. Of course it's not him. Now get out of my way. Crawford stepped out of the car, scowling at them. I'm trying to bring my friend to the airport. Open the trunk, demanded Bree. Excuse me? snorted Crawford. That isn't going to happen. I'm a bounty hunter. Bree stalked over to the driver's side of the vehicle, pushing Crawford aside. If I have reasonable cause to believe my quarry is in a house or a vehicle, I have the right to enter. I'll get my lawyer involved over this. Crawford threatened as Bree pushed the button to pop open the trunk of the car. Everett quickly opened it before Crawford could try to shut it. Empty except the suitcase. Is it big enough to put a person in? asked Bree. Not an adult, Everett said grimly. He grabbed out his cell phone where Marty was still listening. What happened, Marty? I don't know. Marty was furiously typing. I can only think that the camera feed was showing old video in hopes that I would mess up. Or he looks so much like David through the grainy feed that we mistook this guy for my uncle, growled Everett. Then David wasn't here at all, said a heavily disappointed Bree. I told you that already, groused Crawford. Now get your car out of my way so we can get to the airport. Kepler isn't going to be happy, moaned Bree. Kepler? Agent Kepler from the FBI? Paled Crawford. What about him? The FBI are on their way, thinking that David was here, explained Bree. You told the FBI to come? Crawford was white. I need to go now. Move your car! Everett frowned as a glint of gold on the luggage caught his eye in the sunlight. Leaning over, he pulled the monogram tag on the zipper sideways so that he could better see it. He pulled in a shaky breath as an idea came to him. It was a bit far-fetched, but why not? Why wouldn't David have done it? He thought about the eyes of the man who had glared at him through the passenger window. They had been arrogant and hate-filled. Everett turned suspiciously to Crawford. What is your friend's name? None of your business. Crawford pushed on Everett and slammed the trunk closed. Really? Everett went past him to try to get a better glimpse into the car, but the driver's side door slammed shut. The man had crawled into the driver's seat and started the vehicle. Get back! Bree cried out as the car's engine revved and it reversed right into her vehicle, denting it. Moving forward, the man drove over the lawn and curb to get to the street. Everett and Crawford barely managed to get out of the way in time as the car zipped past them. Crawford winced as the muffler came off. Let's go! Everett grabbed Bree, hauling her along to the car. Why? You said it wasn't David! Bree quickly got in. Plastic surgery? Everett explained his theory. He had no doubts now that it was true. The monogrammed initials on the luggage were DMR, for David Michael Ramsley. 
The man was driving away like a maniac. It could only be David. Floor it! She hastily complied, following David down the road. We are going south, Everett informed Marty as he put on his seatbelt. He reached over Bree, pulling hers over and clipping her in. Get Kepler on the phone and let him know. Will do. Marty was jubilant. Do you know the reward on this guy? Ten million? Bree tapped the dash. I think he killed our radiator. What? Everett looked at her in alarm. No. Yep, the car is heating up. Bree was grim. Tell Bill to hurry. David just took a turn. I'm tracking your phone, Marty told her. Sending the information to Kepler. He's five minutes out. I'm going to end up wrecking this car, grimaced Bree as she watched the gauge go higher. Ten million, Marty reminded Bree. We can afford a new car. Just don't lose sight of David. We want to make sure the FBI gets him. Bree leaned over the steering wheel, ready to take the curb and follow David as he took a shortcut around a corner, leaving ruts in someone's lawn. He clipped a garbage can and trash was strewn all over the street. Everett braced himself for the bumps. This is crazy. It's fun, grinned Bree. It was. Everett thought it might also be one of the most addictive things he had ever done. He went down the alley. Bree slowed for the turn, making certain to clear the fenced-in area. How far away is Kepler? asked Everett. He should be right in front of you, Marty told them. I can see blue lights, Bree pointed ahead of David's car. David made a wild swerve, then hit the gas, ramming a car that was blocking the alleyway. Bree hit the brakes, bringing their car to a stop. Black cars with blue lights blocked the alley behind them and in front of David. They watched as men raced past them, securing the car. Moments later, David was handcuffed. Kepler knocked on Bree's window. She rolled down the glass. That doesn't look like David, he commented darkly. Plastic surgery, explained Everett. Do a fingerprint or DNA test. It's him. We'll see, grimaced Kepler. If it isn't, we're all in serious trouble. I will pay for any of the damages, offered Everett. The person's lawn back there, the whole bit. Nice. Over that won't save my career if this goes bust, sighed Kepler. It's him insisted Everett. I hope so, Kepler commented as they all watched David get into the back of the FBI vehicle. If not, I'm sending the bill for this little operation to you. That's fine, Everett assured him. His luggage is in the trunk. Here is a copy of the flash drive. Bree dug through her purse and handed it over. It has all the data on it. It should be more than enough to put David behind bars for the rest of his life. It also implicates Uncles James and Oscar. Everett wasn't happy about that. Marty had delved into the data further, and they now knew that each of the Ramsley businesses were involved in the money laundering scheme. However, it clears everyone else of wrongdoing. None of my cousins knew about the illegal money going through any of the family businesses. That means you can leave my brothers Jake and Dylan alone. I will be the judge of that. Kepler pocketed the USB drive. There still be penalties and jail time for certain individuals. We'll see what the justice system decides. Look, we helped you get David. Everett was frustrated. Jake and Dylan are innocent. They didn't know about the money. They were the heads of Ramsley Insurance in this country. Kepler's icy gaze bore into Everett. They're responsible for what happens in their companies. Like I said, we'll continue the investigation. The judges will determine fines and jail times. Bree laid a hand on Everett's arm. There was no point in arguing with Kepler any further. She knew that from experience. Kepler gave them a nod before moving forward to talk to the other agents on the case. If you enjoyed this chapter of In Pursuit of a Billionaire, Book 8 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for the epilogue. Also, you can find my books on Amazon. There are audiobooks, ebooks, and paperbacks. Happy reading!